The arrival of Tiberium on Earth saw the Brotherhood of Nod as the first to take advantage of the crystal's mineral-rich properties, with the Global Defense Initiative doing the same shortly afterward. The two factions also discovered the dangerous and even lethal side effects inherent to the alien crystal. While GDI sought to prevent and mitigate the damage Tiberium caused to organic life, the Brotherhood of Nod, who saw Tiberium as the key to humanity's future, looked into weaponizing the crystal in order to crush all who dare oppose them, and most importantly, their messiah and prophet, Cain. To that end, the Brotherhood came up with a variety of Tiberium-based weapon systems that they used during their major conflicts with the Global Defense Initiative. By the Third War, the Brotherhood quickly realized they weren't the only ones to weaponize Tiberium, as the Skrin proved themselves to be the true masters of the crystal. And while GDI claims to be the biggest opponent of Tiberium, they too could not resist the urge to try and weaponize it for their own purposes. The first Tiberium weapons created by the Brotherhood were portable, infantry-sized systems primarily used as anti-infantry weapons. The Nod troops designated with wielding such weapons were called Chemical Warriors. The first of these troops were outfitted with a basic gas mask, helmet, and grey military fatigues. This outfit allowed them to walk through a Tiberium field with no fear of any adverse health effects. The weapon they carried, which was just called the Chem Spray, resembled a flamethrower, but instead of shooting flames, it released a short-lived toxic cloud of Tiberium gas at the target. This weapon was highly effective against enemy infantry, with the noxious gas killing them in a matter of seconds. However, the weapon was only effective at close range, so there was a good chance of being killed while closing the distance to the target. This weapon, along with the Tiberium mixed gas it used, may have been developed at a Nod Bio Research Laboratory in Yugoslavia. Acting on intelligence decoded from an agent known as Delphi, General Shepard ordered the destruction of the facility, as the intel indicated that Kane himself had been cornered there. The lab was destroyed using the Ion Cannon. Unfortunately for GDI, the intel was wrong, as Kane was not at the facility. The Chemical Warriors were an integral part of a Brotherhood covert operations mission called the Tiberium Strain. The small force was tasked with infiltrating a GDI base conducting ion research research which made use of a large number of chemicals at the base's biocenters. Once inside the base, they were tasked with destroying the biocenters and contaminating any military and civilian personnel at a nearby village. However, other structures were to be left alone, as the Brotherhood wanted the base's destruction and resulting contamination to look like an internal accident, rather than an attack by an external force. Exactly where in the timeline of events this covert operation took place is not fully known. What we do know is that near the end of the First Tiberium War, the Chemical Warrior's armament was updated. Instead of wearing military fatigues and a gas mask, the Warriors wore a full green hazmat suit, with black boots, gloves, a harness, and a domed helmet, which enclosed the entire head. This suit offered greater protection when operating near sources of Tiberium or Tib-related flora and fauna, such as blossom trees and viceroids. The most important upgrade to the Warriors' arsenal was their new chem sprayer, which was dubbed the Venom. Unlike the previous version, whose toxic cloud was short-lived, the Venom released a continuous stream of gaseous clouds and liquid sprays of Tiberium. A volatile concoction, one that could even cause damage to light vehicles. The weapon had slightly increased range compared to the previous one, though it was still best used in close quarters and against infantry. While it typically killed anyone unfortunate enough to be in front of the barrel, some victims would instead have their bodies broken down and transformed into the fleshy, blob-like creatures known as viceroids. The Venom was quite portable, and the user no longer needed to carry a large tank on their back. Instead, the weapon had three small, cylindrical-shaped canisters, which held the Tiberium mix. This mix could possibly be made of the waste that is left over from raw Tiberium after it has been processed at a refinery. The canisters are attached to each other, and then to the underside of the gun, just in front of the trigger. This makes for easier and faster reloading, especially in comparison to having a tank on one's back. In addition, the weapon features a large stock and trigger, a carrying handle on top, and another hand on the left side for better support and stability, either when holding the weapon at the ready, or actively engaging hostiles. The major downside to the Venom Sprayer was that it was only effective at close range. 
Consequently, the Brotherhood sought to create a long-range Tiberium weapon for their infantry. Ultimately, what they came up with was the Tiberium or Tiberian automatic rifle, nicknamed the Mantis. There is a slight inconsistency with this gun's naming, as the Renegade manual uses the word Tiberian, but the in-game name uses the word Tiberium. Either way, I'll just be referring to it as the Mantis. The Mantis was a long-range anti-personnel rifle that fired Tiberium cartridges, which would poison whoever it hit. Even if an enemy combatant survived the impact of the round, the Tiberium within, or on the round itself, would be released into the person's body, poisoning them and resulting in their death or transformation into a visceroid shortly afterward. The Mantis featured a bullpup design, meaning the firing and reload mechanism were located at the back of the rifle, behind the trigger, instead of the front. This design increased the barrel length of the rifle, without increasing the overall length of the entire weapon. The weapon also features a carrying handle on top, which would seem to be where the iron sights are located. The magazine for the gun held 50 rounds, and could be fired in either automatic or semi-automatic. The cartridges don't appear to be filled with Tiberium. Instead, it seems that the weapon has a mechanism whereby liquid Tiberium coats the round right before it exits the barrel, hence the noticeable streak of green trailing the round as it flies through the air. Loud when fired, trace amounts of ionized radiation from the Tiberium-coated rounds can be detected with each shot. The rifle was primarily used by the Brotherhood's Acolyte and Templar soldiers. These were the first genetically enhanced cybernetic super-soldiers of the Brotherhood. Scientist Elena Petrova also used this rifle in her fight against GDI Commando Havoc as he tried to rescue Sidney Mobius, daughter of the famed Ignatio Mobius. Interestingly, Sidney Mobius also carries this weapon during the multiplayer mode of Command & Conquer Renegade. The Tiberium Fléché gun, or Talon as it's better known, was the last of the Tiberium weapons used during the First War. One in-game description of the gun calls it a rifle, however, it looks and functions more like a submachine gun. The weapon is quite simple in its operation when compared to the Mantis. Whereas the Mantis fires Tiberium-infused rounds, the Talon fires actual Tiberium shards. The gun could be fired in either single or automatic mode. It has a high rate of fire, making it very effective in close quarters, especially as a personal defense weapon. The magazine carries 100 shards, and is loaded directly in front of the trigger, right under the barrel. A gas cartridge, located at the back of the gun, propels the shards forward out of the barrel, just like a nail gun. This must have been an experimental prototype weapon, as it was only discovered by Havoc Parker as he made his way through Kane's temple to rescue Sydney. He found it in the same room that had a small blossom tree on the table. The only other person to use this gun was a squad member of the Dead Six Commando team named Eric Patch Wolf, and only in the multiplayer mode of Command & Conquer Renegade. Tiberium infantry weapons wouldn't be seen again in the Brotherhood's arsenal until long after the Second Tiberium War. In 2047, during the Third War, the Brotherhood of Nod convinced GDI's leading Tiberium expert, Dr. Alphonse Giraud, to defect and work for them. His research later culminated in the creation of the Tiberium Trooper. Quoting from the Intelligence Database, With the defection of GDI's Dr. Giraud in 2047, Nod's ongoing experiments with liquid Tiberium have finally begun to bear fruit in the form of portable, battlefield-ready weaponry. The Tiberium Trooper is the first Nod combatant to utilize these new armaments. His heavily armored, cybernetically enhanced form is equipped with two large containment tanks and a reinforced spray nozzle, allowing the rapid dispersion of liquid Tiberium over a large area. The Tiberium Troopers were exclusive to the Marked of Cain arsenal, replacing the flame-focused Black Hand squads of other Nod divisions. Just like their Chemical Warrior predecessors of the First War, the Tiberium Troopers were highly effective at dealing with infantry especially those that were garrisoned inside of buildings. Advances in liquid Tiberium research made their weapons more volatile and corrosive. With enough concentration of liquid tea, their weapons were quite effective against light vehicles and buildings. A couple of troopers could even garrison a Redeemer Mechwalker, giving it a Tiberium spray weapon with which to easily kill enemy infantry. 
The trooper's outfit was more than just the simple gas mask, military fatigues, and or hazmat suit of the original chemical warriors. They now had extra armor attached to their body in the form of shoulder pads, a chest plate, and splash guards on their legs and feet. The troopers carried two large Tiberium tanks on their back, which had a tube that ran from the tanks to the newly designed gun held in their hands at all times. The troopers were also equipped with various cybernetic enhancements which made them more resistant to most light weapons fire from enemy infantry, and provided them immunity to the negative effects of moving through Tiberium fields. They could gain additional enhancements in the form of cybernetic legs, which significantly increased their speed. Of course, the troopers still had their own share of weaknesses, such as their weapons being less effective against heavy armored vehicles, and completely useless against aircraft. By now though, the Brotherhood had developed a plethora of other Tiberium-based weapon systems, the first of which had been deployed during the Second Tiberium War. By the Second War, advances in Tiberium weaponry culminated in the development of short-range ballistic missiles called chemical missiles, which were launched from underground silos. The Tiberium warheads of these missiles did not come from the crystals. Instead, they were derived from veinhole monsters particularly their veins, which could grow to cover large swaths of the Earth's surface. The veins would be gathered using a vehicle called the Weed Eater. This vehicle would then take the veins over to a structure called the Tiberium Waste Facility. Here, they would be refined and concentrated into a warhead, which is then mounted onto the missile. The impact of the missile alone was capable of destroying a single structure. However, a more devastating impact was caused by the toxic cloud of Tiberium that would spread out and kill or damage any infantryman, vehicle, or structure caught within it. In addition, infantry that died within the cloud could be transformed into visceroids, who, if agitated enough, would cause further damage to any and everything around it. The Brotherhood of Nod used these missiles to great effect at the height of the Second War, against targets all over Western Europe and the Mediterranean. The impacts of some of these missiles caused a chain reaction that reformatted the Earth at the atomic level into pure toxic Tiberium, causing widespread devastation. With the help of the Forgotten, GDI Commander Michael McNeil was able to take out a chemical supply base in Denmark, which was researching and creating the toxin used in the chemical missiles. Afterwards, McNeil led GDI forces in an assault on the primary chemical missile plant near Hamburg, Germany, successfully destroying it. While the chemical missile helped to accelerate the growth of Tiberium across Western Europe and the Mediterranean, they were not the final act in Kate's plan to bring about a Tiberian future for Earth. That task would be left to the most powerful weapon in the Brotherhood's arsenal at the time, the world-altering missile. Created thanks to the knowledge that Cain had deciphered from the Tacitus, this missile held enough Tiberium to transform the entire planet from carbon-based life to Tiberium-based life. Cain hoped to achieve this by launching the missile into the stratosphere and detonating it, with the resulting explosion sending a shockwave that would spread all across the surface of the Earth. What kind of Tiberium-based life the planet's carbon-based life forms would have been transformed into is unknown, assuming it worked the way Cain predicted. Perhaps the Tiberium life forms based off humans would look similar to the Initiates, Acolytes, and Templars brought about thanks to Kane's Regenesis project from the First War. Or perhaps the transformation would have gone beyond that. In the end, Michael McNeil would lead an assault against Kane's stronghold in Cairo, Egypt, just in time to destroy the missile, preventing its launch. He was then able to rescue the forgotten Umagon, and retrieve the Tacitus after he had severely wounded Kane. After Cain recovered from his injuries and reunited the Brotherhood, he began rebuilding his organization. In 2047, he would start the Third Tiberium War by destroying the GDSS Philadelphia and launching a series of coordinated strikes against Blue Zones all across the planet. As with the First and Second Wars, the Brotherhood continued developing new Tiberium-based weapon systems before and during the Third Tiberium War. It was important to develop new ones, as the nature of Tiberium had gone through an evolution, transforming itself into a self-replicating proton lattice. One enhancement that probably carried over from the First and Second Wars was the ability to infuse the body of a Nod soldier with a dose of Tiberium. This treatment made Nod militants, rocket soldiers, and fanatics stronger by increasing their stamina, vitality, and immunity to Tiberium crystals while in a field. 
This infusion treatment was done at a building called the Secret Shrine. One knew when a Nod Commander was performing these infusions at their shrine, thanks to the cloud of green smoke that could be seen rising from the chimney. After the infusion, the treated soldiers would emanate a green shroud from their bodies. Of course, Tiberium can also be used to improve the Brotherhood's weapon systems, and not just its soldiers. One of these improvements came in the form of Tiberium Core missiles. These would replace the standard high-explosive warheads of missiles equipped on Nod's attack bikes, stealth tanks, and SAM turrets, as well as the Black Hand's Mantis drones. These missiles use Tiberium to increase their penetrative power, thereby increasing the damage they deal to both ground and air targets, particularly armored ones such as vehicles and structures. Other more devastating Tiberium weapons research was discovered by GDI during the Third War, when they raided a Nod research lab in Egypt. Quoting from the intelligence database, An advanced Nod Tiberium weapon research program was recently uncovered when a GDI strike team in North Africa stormed a Nod facility originally thought to be a chemical weapons factory. Science Division evaluation of the wreckage subsequently confirmed several large-scale Tiberium weaponization efforts underway. Of most concern to Enops is evidence of significant progress towards the creation of a liquid Tiberium device of unprecedented destructive power. The liquid form of Tiberium is a relatively new manifestation of the alien substance, and its properties are not well known. Nod's liquid Tiberium research appears to be 5 to 10 years ahead of Science Division. There are also indications that Nod is working on a more conventional airborne Tiberium explosive, and a catalyst for detonating existing Tiberium crystal deposits in a subcritical reaction. Analysis of past Nod R&D efforts, which tend to be redundant and decentralized in nature, suggests the Nod lab in North Africa was only one of several facilities participating in the Tiberium weaponization efforts. Research at this laboratory contributed to the development of both the Catalyst Missile and Tiberium Vapor Bomb in Nod's arsenal. Both of these weapons could be properly supplied and armed at a structure called the Tiberium Chemical Plant, easily recognizable by the two smokestacks located on each side of the cylindrical-shaped main building, as well as the windows that show green liquid tea inside of the structure. The Vapor Bomb was an airburst weapon that was dropped via a Nod Armageddon Bomber. The bomber would fly over the designated target and drop its single payload. The bomb itself had four additional containers attached to it that would split off in all directions and release Tiberium vapor into the air just above the target. A couple seconds later, the vapor would ignite, causing a great explosion that destroyed all ground units and some buildings within its vicinity. The weapon was quite devastating to personnel and vehicles that were bunched up in a group, or structures that were built in close proximity to each other. However, the bomber can be shot down before reaching its target. The Catalyst Missile was a weapon that was developed in the later stage of the Third War, just in time for the Skren invasion. Kane thought that the Skren, or Visitors as he called them, would be quite hostile, and so developed this weapon as a means of effectively dealing with them. That's why I developed a weapon that targets their weakness. Now, this will allow you to claim one of their towers, but you must act fast. The visitors are attacking the facility as we speak. Secure the facility, then feel free to test out this new addition to your arsenal. The Catalyst missiles were produced at a research facility in northern Italy, a facility that would come under attack by the Skrin. Kane sent one of his best commanders to secure the facility. Once secured and repaired, he could then use the missiles against Skrin forces in the area. A direct hit from the missile itself did not do much damage. However, it was capable of detonating existing Tiberium crystal deposits in a subcritical reaction. This meant the missile was highly effective against the Skrin, as practically all their forces and structures are derived of Tiberium in some form or another. This did not mean the weapon was useless against GDI, though. When used against structures like refineries, silos, and even Tiberium spikes, the missile was more than capable of bringing them crumbling to the ground thanks to the chain reaction caused by the stored Tiberium. It could even destroy harvesters loaded with Tiberium, or cause the crystals of a Tiberium field to burst, which would either destroy or damage any units within it. Thanks to the research of Dr. Giraud after his defection to Nod, the Brotherhood had another way to deal with enemy harvesters or refineries that were in and around a Tiberium field. 
Dr. Giro developed a way for not to excite or charge underground Tiberium veins below a field of crystals. This process would cause the crystals to detonate, resulting in a shockwave that spread across the entire field, significantly damaging or destroying everything around the detonating crystals. Legion put the vein detonation to great use against Zocom bases in China, as part of the AI's mission to retrieve the Tacitus. The primary difference between this weapon and the Catalyst missile was that the missile would not destroy the actual Tiberium crystals, whereas the vein detonation would cause them to explode, sending their shards flying in all directions at high speeds. This also meant that any surviving harvesters have less Tiberium available to harvest, and must wait for new crystals to grow. All these weapons, however, pale in comparison to Kane's ultimate one, the Liquid Tiberium Bomb. This was a device Kane had been researching and developing since before the Third War, acting as a successor to the original world-altering missile. Much of the work on the weapon had been done primarily at the Kasabad Research Facility in Egypt, and the research lab in the Amazon Desert, which was part of the Brazilian Yellow Zone. Once all the necessary components had been created, Kane had them transported to his Temple Prime in Sarajevo for assembly. A special truck was designed to carry the components of the device, but the trip was not without problems. First, the transport plane carrying the truck was shot down, requiring its rescue by Nod forces in Slovenia. By the time it reached Temple Prime, GDI forces were already in place attacking the temple. The truck was escorted around GDI forces, finally going underground into the temple for final assembly and armament. If detonated, such a bomb would generate the greatest explosion the world had ever seen. This was according to Dr. Giraud, when he was still working with GDI as their leading Tiberium expert. This much is certain. Our raw data is still preliminary, but we believe a liquid Tiberium explosion would have a yield roughly 10 times greater than a 200 megaton thermonuke. Now, with a proper catalyst, such a blast may also create a self-sustaining exothermic reaction. You're talking about a chain reaction. Precisely. Any proximate Tiberium deposit, liquid or crystal, would be instantly detonated. After the first GDI assault on Temple Prime was repelled, a second assault was initiated by a more competent commander, who successfully brought down all the temple's defenses. GDI's president, Redmond Boyle, gave the final order to use an ion cannon to wipe Temple Prime off the map, despite the protest of General Jack Granger, who knew that such a blast would be devastating. Tell me, General, our ace at defenses, they're back online, are they not? You're not suggesting the ion cannon? No, General, I'm not suggesting it. I'm ordering it. You realize we're talking about a facility where liquid Tiberium was being manufactured. An ion cannon blast could be disastrous to the region. Sandra, I need Dr. Giraud in Brazil. Excuse me, General, but Dr. Giraud is missing, and it appears he's been captured by Nod. Well, that settles it. Commander, I want you to end this once and for all. Kane and much of his inner circle are believed to have been killed. The explosion also detonated a liquid Tiberium deposit hidden beneath the temple itself, producing deadly fallout and radiation levels over most of Eastern Europe. As Granger had feared, the detonation of the liquid Tiberium bomb brought death and destruction across much of Eastern Europe. And at that time, unknown to the Global Defense Initiative and many within the Brotherhood, this explosion would trigger the first invasion of the Skrin exactly as Kane had planned from the very beginning of the war. It should come as no surprise that the Skrin would harness Tiberium to develop weapons for use against any hostile species they encountered in their goal to harvest Tiberium-infested planets. To a certain extent, all Skrin could be considered Tiberium weapons in and of themselves, but I'll be focusing on the more overt creatures and systems within their arsenal. The first of which are Conversion Beams. This is a unique ability that only Devourer tanks and Reaper tripods of the Reaper 17 sect possess. It allows them to charge their beam weapons by breaking down and absorbing Tiberium inside them. 
For the Devourer tanks, their very name actually refers to this ability to absorb Tiberium in order to supercharge their main weapon. A green cloud would emanate from those biomechanical creatures that made this conversion, and the color of their beams would be green, instead of the default purple and blue. The absorbed Tiberium boosts the destructive power of their beams against any and all ground targets. Devourers and tripods of the Reaper sect can even upgrade themselves with conversion reserves, thereby increasing the amount of Tiberium they can absorb and use as supercharged beams against enemy forces. Corruptors were the Skren version of Nod's Tiberium troopers, only they were a single, large, bug-like creature, easily identifiable thanks to the green sack at the rear of its body. The sack was filled with a Tiberium-based concoction that was effective at killing infantry and melting down buildings. Not all human infantry would be killed by the toxin. Some would have the unfortunate fate of being transformed into Visceroids, much like the Tiberium weapons used by the Brotherhood during the First and Second Wars. The toxin from the Corruptor had the exact opposite effect on its fellow Skrin. Instead of damage and death, it provided healing and repair. However, the Corruptor was quite slow moving, and made for an easily identifiable target for GDI Nod forces to engage and kill. The Skrin understood that simply launching shards of Tiberium at high speeds was also an effective means of destroying their enemies. To that end, the Skrin had a specific creature dedicated to using these shards, the Ravager. This small but swift creature had four legs, and what looks to be a single glowing eye at the head. Growing out of its back were green Tiberium crystals, which it launched at its enemies. The Ravager was effective against infantry and even light vehicles, but fared poorly against heavy armored tanks or aircraft. The Ravagers could also merge with the giant Eradicator Hexapod, allowing it to launch shards as a secondary attack in conjunction with the Eradicator's primary plasma disc launcher. The Ravagers also had the unique ability to agitate Tiberium found on or inside infantry, vehicles, and structures. This attack could cause significant damage to a refinery, and potentially destroy harvesters carrying a full load of Tiberium. Sometimes, a Skrin foreman wanted more than just Ravagers equipped with shard launchers. By way of the technology assembler, the foreman could replace the plasma weapon systems used on the photon cannons and plasma missile batteries with these new shard launchers, which could then do more damage to infantry and vehicles. The shard launchers could also be mounted onto the Skrin's seeker tanks, further increasing their firepower. Mechapedes, which were basically biomechanical centipedes, could have shard launchers attached to each segment of their body, for a total of eight launchers. The Reaper 17 sect could take their shard weapons to another level. First, replacing the standard Skrid Walker with a mutated version called the Shard Walker. Then, they could mutate their Shard Walkers and Ravagers to carry the more lethal blue Tiberium shards instead of the green ones. While green shards were already quite effective against armored units, the blue shards could shred through them with ease. When the invasion began, the Skrin quickly realized that the humans of Earth were using Tiberium to fund and support their own military operations. The Skrin would try and deny GDI and the Brotherhood access to these fields by infesting them with a Tiberium Hive. The Tiberium Hive functioned similarly to the Buzzer Hive, except that it would be constructed on top of a Tiberium Chasm, releasing small drones that would infest the entire Tiberium field, attacking anything that entered it, including other Skrin. These drones were quite deadly against both infantry and ground vehicles, and could only be killed when the entire hive structure was destroyed. The last Tiberian weapon in the invading Skrin's arsenal was called Overlord's Wrath. The Skrin foreman could call in a few Tiberium-saturated asteroids that would land on top of the target location, causing a massive amount of damage to anything within the impact zone, and leaving behind a small amount of Tiberium. The asteroid would also leave behind a small ion storm, which caused more green crystals to grow at the impact site. Where the Skren acquired these asteroids is not fully known. My best guess would be that the Skren mining fleet brought them from the Kuiper or asteroid belts as they made their way towards Earth. However, this would also mean that the Skren seeded the asteroids with Tiberium before dropping them onto the planet. The name Overlord's Wrath could indicate that the asteroids were sent all the way from the Skren world of Ikor Hub 
although I doubt they could have traveled that quickly through space and arrived in time to support the invasion. Alternatively, this support power could simply be viewed as a homage to the initial asteroid that first brought Tiberium to Earth back in 1995, which just goes to show that Tiberium, through its terraforming capabilities, is in and of itself a weapon used against other interstellar or intergalactic species. If that's the case, it would imply that the Skren have actually been waging war against humanity for the past 57 years. The Global Defense Initiative would have many believe that they are the only ones who could save the planet from Tiberium proliferation. On the surface, this seems to be true. After all, GDI consistently opposes the Brotherhood of Nod and its view of the crystal. The organization also invented sonic weapons, designed to break down Tiberium in order to restore the Earth to its natural environment. However, in reality, GDI has secretly performed research into Tiberium-related weaponry. Research that may have been going on since the First Tiberium War. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned a Nod covert operations mission that involved sabotaging a GDI ion research facility. One that made use of a large number of chemicals stored in the facility's biocenters. It's possible that some of these chemicals were derived from Tiberium, especially considering that there was a large field right outside the facility. This could indicate that Tiberium played a key role in the further development of GDI's ion cannons. Whether this role was just simply using the Tiberium to fund the facility, or being a part of the actual research is unknown. Ultimately, the full truth of this facility is lost, since it was destroyed by the Brotherhood and made to look like an accident. In the interim years between the Second and Third Tiberium Wars, GDI secretly established a facility in the Australian Outback one that was dedicated to researching liquid Tiberium. The lab was run by Dr. James de Groot, chair of the GDI Institute for Tiberium Research. No one knows the full details related to the liquid tea research that was being done here, but it had a bad reputation amongst GDI scientists and researchers. An intercepted transmission archived in the intelligence database revealed an email from Director Elliot Smith Johnson of the Department of Covert R&D to Dr. Groot which showcases the issues that plagued this facility. Jack, I'm running out of excuses here. One more accident like that, and the council will have my neck, and your budget. You've lost almost two dozen workers in the last year alone, and, as you are well aware, these aren't your garden variety beaker slingers. These are top-ranked TIB scientists, and they're getting harder to replace. You have to understand, Jack, people just don't want to work for you. Not with all that's happened already, no matter how many zeros we add to their paychecks. I understand the potential you see in Liquid Tiberium, and I applaud your passion, but I'm beginning to side with those in the Council who seriously doubt whether this line of inquiry will amount to anything other than billions of credits and lives down the drain. Listen, Jack, I'm at the end of my tether here. Get it together and start producing results, or we're going to shut you down. Elliot wouldn't have to worry about shutting the lab down, as the Brotherhood of Nod would do it for him. Once Kane learned of this facility's existence, he ordered the Black Hand to destroy it, as a grand gesture to signal the Brotherhood's unified return. The destruction of this lab caused a great explosion. Not as great as that of the liquid Tiberium bomb beneath Sarajevo, but enough to turn the Australian outback into a giant red zone. This incident put a major dent in GDI's public image, as they tried to spin the disaster as an accident, and not an attack by the Brotherhood. No! No, sir, no one has seen any sign of Nod! Look, I'm being told that this was an accident! Caught by it. An archived news report from Channel 237 Nightly News details a live report given by one Leanne Downing from Hobart, Tasmania. It all started as a green glow in the sky, visible from as far as Auckland, New Zealand. Now, as panicked citizens attempt to flee what appears to be the largest environmental catastrophe since the Tiber incident, the world is asking one question. Who did this, and why? There are widespread fears that this horrific event is a sign that the long dormant Brotherhood of Nod has returned. However, highly placed sources within GDI have informed us that the catalyst for this explosion may have been an accident in a top-secret GDI Tiberium research laboratory in the Australian outback. Now, as millions are driven from their homes, as a continent is consumed by the deadly crystal, one can only ask, why did GDI let this happen? What are they really doing to protect us?
The Brotherhood of Nod were not the only ones to develop a liquid Tiberium bomb during the Third War. GDI successfully, and secretly, confiscated much of the Brotherhood's research into the weapon from their facility in Kasabad. They may have even combined the research results from their former Australian facility with the new information taken from Nod. Under the directive of GDI's newest president, Redmond Boyle, GDI scientists and engineers were able to develop their own liquid Tiberium bomb, one that Boyle wanted a top GDI commander to use to defeat the Skren at Ground Zero. Under my guidance, GDI Weapons Tech used the materials we confiscated from Nod to build our own liquid Tiberium bomb, which I've taken the liberty of arming your troops with. Now Granger, he'd rather have you try and gut out a victory against impossible odds. Why? Because I'm a political threat to him. If my plan wins this war, he's irrelevant. At least that's how the media will see him. But they'll see you as a hero if you end this war quickly. Once Granger found out about this weapon's creation, he implored the commander not to use it, as it would betray all that GDI stood for. But as bad as things seem to be on the battlefield, I need you to resist using that liquid Tiberium bomb. It may end the war quickly, but a blast that size in the world's largest red zone, the chain reaction could be cataclysmic. And here's the other thing. You use that bomb, and we're setting in motion a very dangerous precedent. We'll become dependent on Tiberium weapons, on Tiberium itself. And that's not who we are. That's not GDI. We fight with honor and courage. We fight to rid the world of Tiberium. Let me tell you who we are. We are the ones the public has entrusted to protect them. We have a responsibility to uphold that trust. Yes, there are risks. Yes, there will be casualties. But this is war against an enemy unlike any mankind has ever seen. If you don't do everything in your power, if you don't use every asset available to end this war right now, then you are failing every man, woman, and child on this planet. Do the right thing, Commander. That's all I can ask. Just do the right thing. The commander most likely chose not to use the liquid Tiberium bomb, as we do not see any Tiberium weapons in GDI's arsenal during the events of Kane's Wrath. But if the commander did make the decision to use the weapon, the ICBM that it was mounted on would launch from an undesignated location, and would land down on the target, which in this situation was the alien control node, easily destroying it and stopping the entire Skrin invasion in an instant. While this bomb would certainly bring a swift end to the war, it would do so at a heavy price. The war against the invaders ended today, but at a staggering cost. A liquid Tiberium bomb, detonated by GDI in the Mediterranean Red Zone, set off a chain reaction, sending shockwaves thousands of miles in every direction. So far, the death toll is over 25 million people, GDI and Nod, and scientists are predicting even more tragic fallout in the weeks and months to come. In addition to the millions dead, and GDI's reputation being permanently tarnished, General Jack Granger would resign, paving the way for the commander to be appointed as the new leader of GDI's military. Now as for you, Commander, you're a disgrace to that uniform. Tens of millions dead and your entire force killed in action. I'd court-martial you myself if I could. Unfortunately, your friend Boyle's convinced the media you're a hero, so I can't touch you. You still have to live with yourself. Good luck with that. Well, what did I tell you, Commander? History is written by the winners. One minute to the press conference, Director. So I'm sure you've heard Granger has resigned to spend more time with his family. That means my first order of business at this press conference is to put you in charge of the military. Stick with me, Commander, and we'll lead GDI to a brave new future. <laughs> By not using the liquid Tiberium bomb at Ground Zero, the Commander was hailed as a true hero who stopped an alien invasion and prevented the needless loss of life on military and civilian personnel in the region. 
while also preserving GDI's reputation in the eyes of the public. The one thing the Commander could not do, though, is stop the development of future Tiberium weapons by the Brotherhood of Nod, and their continued conflicts against GDI, and their quest to achieve ascension. In addition to whatever weapons the alien Skrin create elsewhere in the cosmos.